Good afternoon, everybody. How are we doing today? Wonderful. Wait, that sounded a little enthusiastic. I was hoping for a little bit more because this is, I've got to be honest, one of my favorite parts of the entire year here. So how are we doing today? There we go. That's the right enthusiasm I like to see. Thank you folks for joining us on this President's Day here at the National Constitution Center. Uh, we have an exciting program ahead of us. Uh, we have a full day of activities here at the museum. Uh, but to really uh, welcome you folks to this space. I wanted to introduce a friend of the National Constitution Center. Uh, Jeff Brandon is the market president for TD Bank Pennsylvania. Uh, TD Bank has generously made our free admission today here at the National Constitution Center and helped really make the most of this day and the really exciting program we're about to have. But Jeff, if you'd like to share a little bit with the folks, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, as Brian said, I'm Jeff Brandon. I'm TD Bank's market president for Pennsylvania. And I also have the privilege of serving on the President's Council here at the National Constitution Center. But far and away, my best title today is costume contest judge. So it is my privilege, along with um, presidents, uh, the presidents that you'll meet shortly, um, to decide among the, the wonderful creativity and talent that we've already seen here today. Um, just a few quick words about the partnership between TD Bank and the National Constitution Center. For many years, um, we have collaborated during the month of February to celebrate the um, incredible heritage and achievements of Black Americans and you know, how they have helped to shape the story of We the People. So our uh, ability to provide free admission to folks from all over the Delaware Valley, and in fact, the country, and I'm told the world, um, is, a, is a great honor for us. We're thrilled with that affiliation. Uh, and we're going to continue that learning um, by also helping provide some monthly virtual tours for the center's um, Civil War and Reconstruction exhibit. So we hope you'll enjoy that as well. Um, but without further ado, Brian, back to you. We hope everyone enjoys the program. I'm sure it's going to be a great town hall with the presidents. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. All right. Well, folks, I know we didn't come here to see me as excited as I am to see all of you. So I wanted to introduce our really honored, esteemed guests that we have here today. Do we know who we're looking for? My friend Charles is ready. All right, Thomas Jefferson. So we're gonna welcome Presidents Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln. Gentlemen, would you like to join us? All right. Mr. President. 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 Yes, Mr. President. Oh, just Brian. Oh, Brian. Hello, Mr. Brian. <laughs> Mr. Brian. Uh, like, first, I'm just, yes. I, I do feel like I should be like George Washington in this position, huh? <laughs> hmm. I uh, know, Mr. Uh, Brian, it wasn't, it didn't go well. You have about the right height. That's yeah. true. But your well, teeth are far too good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll check back <laughs> in a couple of decades, huh? See how I'm doing compared to George then. Oh, well, well gentlemen, well, as, well, as our guests are arriving, shall we please take a seat? Thank you. It's sir. your day after all. Enjoy I it. I'll take this one. Okay. I'm going to go over, I believe. Oh, I see. Never oh, mind. yes. Yes. All right. Ones. Oh, these uh, are yes. much, uh, quite, quite, quite nice, aren't they? I need to <laughs> Ooh. Oh, yes. sink right in and get lost. Yes. <laughs> all right. <laughs> President Lincoln, you somehow look like you fit in that chair. Yeah. Yeah. Something about, I don't know. It enthrones you somehow. Mm. Well, we have our, our town hall today, folks. Very exciting. We are going to be doing a little bit of a Q&A, talking to our presidents, uh, asking a few questions about their experiences, the job of president of the United States, um, and hear from you folks as well. I know we have a few friends in the audience who are all ready to ask you some hard-hitting questions. But I think that I might, um, if you folks don't mind, get us started with one, just to... to as we mark President's Day, uh, I wanted to ask the three of you gentlemen, uh, is there maybe an accomplishment of yours that you think was the best thing you, you ever did as president of the United States, mm -hmm. that you were really proud of your work? <laughs> well, perhaps, yeah. I, would, who would like to start, Mr. Uh, president, I Mr. Spoke, president? Go in chronological order, I that, think. I think that, 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 that sounds yeah. great. My proudest achievement as president was that I, successfully took on the presidency when Americans were very divided. I was inaugurated in the first presidential election that saw transfer of political power from one president to another president, from one party 
to another party. And I was able to negotiate that very difficult change without causing Americans to fight so much with each other that we tore ourselves apart. Instead, I was able to govern as a president of all of the United States, not merely of a party. That's a very good, very noble thought there. Yeah. Oh, President Lincoln, what well, about you? If I had to, to pick one particular thing out of my career, I would have to say without a uh, moment's hesitation that the drafting and uh, sign-in of the Emancipation Proclamation has to be the greatest achievement in my life, uh, if you ask me. It, uh, uh, well, uh, well, I, I agree. Uh, yes, admirers of the Emancipation. Then, oh. You're on. Oh, oh yes. all right. <laughs> well, uh, yes, I would say, of course, uh, aside from continuing forth with uh, uh, trying to help the tran country transition from the assassination of, of President McKinley, uh, if I were to choose my greatest legacy, apart from my children, of course, <laughs> uh, I would have to say it would be the hundreds upon thousands of acres of natural lands that were set aside uh, as national parks, national monuments, uh, wildlife sanctuaries and bird refuges, so that uh, this country might enjoy the beauty of nature in ways that it might not have normally before, because uh, I fear that if far too many people had their way, the Grand Canyon would become a copper mine. And, uh, and of course, uh, there would be tourist trappings all across some of the most beautiful landscapes in this country. So have any of you been to a national park? Anyone? Yes? Ah, you're welcome. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Oh, wow. We have a hand up in our audience already. Did you have a question, my friend? Were you asking? No. Hmm. <laughs> all right. You know, I knew you've been waiting row. for all morning. Uh, this is my friend Charles in the front row. Sir, do you have a question? How many things did you invent? How many things did I invent? Well, I've been given credit for inventing a lot of things, but in truth, I only invented one thing, truly, and the other things I merely tinkered with. I invented a kind of mold board for a plow. The mold board is a part of the plow that cuts through the soil. And I won't go into too much detail, but I used my geometry while I was traveling in Europe and watching the poor farmers struggle to cut through the very rocky soil very thin, rocky soil in France. And I realized that we needed a better way to do it. So I got out my pen and paper and used my geometry lessons I had learned and designed a plow. And it was a design that worked all over Europe. I sent the design everywhere. It helped farmers all over the world. Now, I I've been given credit for lots of other things like a revolving chair and a spherical sundial and a polygraph for writing. Those are just other people's inventions, and I tinkered with them. If you want someone who's really a true inventor of a lot of things, then you'll have to talk to Benjamin Franklin. Mm. Perhaps another time. But I do believe, um, have either of you gentlemen perhaps invented anything or, or designed anything? <sighs> well, I am, in fact, the only president who was ever granted a patent for an invention. When I was a young man, I worked on the river uh, shipping cargo down on flat boats. And sometimes that flat boat would get stuck on a sandbar in the middle of the river, which we weren't expecting. And you had to wait for the rain to come to raise the river up so you could float off. So I invented a process where there would be these big leather bags and you'd strap them around the bottom of the boat. And then there'd be poles that you would insert in a hole in the top of the bag. And you could use those poles to pump the bag full of air. And all the bags would fill up and lift up the flatboat and float it off the sandbar. And I made a model of it. And you can see it in the patent office down in Washington, which I think is now the portrait gallery, but the, my model's still there. <laughs> uh, nobody ever bought the thing or tried it, but it probably would have worked. But at least I'm the only president with a patent. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, I can't say that I've actually created anything except literature. Most of the work that I've done was, uh, was, was writing on my own experience, although I did write uh, a book on the, uh, the, the naval battles of the War of 1812, uh, which actually became uh, 
required reading for the Naval Academy for years, if my, my understanding is correct. Uh, but of course, the, the beginning of my writing could rival the dictionary for dryness, but uh, I got better over time. Hold How on. many children here have read about the War of 1812? Oh, you should. Oh. You'll enjoy it so much. <laughs> it's a <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. Quite tumultuous. Oh, oh gosh. Well, huh. I don't see any hands up just yet, but keep oh. thinking about some questions oh. we'd like to ask our presidents. Oh, we do have one. Yes. Oh. So for each of your time periods, how did you communicate? How did you communicate messages to the public, to the we, the people you see gathered in front of us? Well, in my day, age. in my day, most people didn't even know what the president of the United States looked like. One of my favorite things to do was to ride around in the federal city, Washington, D.C., on horseback or go for long walks and strike up conversations with average people I'd come across. They had no idea I was the president of the United States. And I'd ask them, what did they think of the president of the United States? And I knew since they didn't know I was the president, that they would give me an honest answer. You see, if they knew I was the president of the United States, they might either tell me something that wasn't quite honest because they were being polite, or they would tell me something that was too honest because they were being impolite. <laughs> <laughs> well, by the time I come along, uh, most people got their information from the newspapers. They were very popular. And um, the telegraph had been invented, so uh, news and interesting uh, information could be sent very rapidly from place to place, or around the world for that matter. And photography had become uh, a very uh, popular uh, pastime for people. I was one of the most photographed fellows of my time, really. And uh, there were still people painting portraits in oils. And one fella come to Springfield after I was uh, nominated to be president and painted a very nice portrait in oils of me and was going to make copies and sell them. Uh, and uh, unfortunately for him, I decided to grow a beard. So his, <laughs> his portraits didn't look like me anymore. And he was in a, in a clove hitch for a while. So he figured he could just paint the beard on. Uh, <laughs> as far as keeping in touch with people, uh, I have regular hours, visiting hours in the White House where anybody from anywhere can come right in, get in line, come to my office and complain about things or ask questions or anything they need. I call them my public opinion baths. <laughs> hey, baths, you said? Baths, yes, yes. Yeah. Very cleansing. Uh, I will say that uh, Mr. Lincoln's efforts are, are very similar to some of my own. Uh, in my lifetime, of course, uh, the newspaper uh, improved in its communication with the telegraph, uh, the uh, transcontinental railroad, and uh, and of course, uh, the intercontinental uh, telegraph was able to uh, communicate a great deal more information more cleanly and plainly. And uh, what I truly found was most beneficial was communicating with the press. I believed very strongly in the rights of the press to have information from their president. They would gather around me when I had time. Sometimes they would gather around me when I was getting my afternoon shave. <laughs> but of course, uh, and then of course, the poor barber was always so concerned that I kept moving around to answer questions that he might nick the president of the United States. But uh, I will say that uh, he was uh, that. Uh, the benefit of being able to communicate directly with the press gave me a much more direct connection to the people than waiting for uh, any sort of congressional efforts to be made. There was a time when um, the Meat Inspection Act was necessary because there were some very poor me uh, meat packing conditions in this country. And uh, well, the meat packers would not uh, submit to actual inspections and better regulation. And so we had a report on some of the things that were found, the less than pleasant things that were found in the meat in, in, in our inspection of those properties. And so uh, we released about half of our findings uh, to the press and they reported it. And then of course, we, uh, we told the good meat packers that we would submit the other half to the press if they didn't wish to continue uh, to uh, go along with inspections. But once that was released, then they, they agreed to the Inspection Act much more readily. So mm. Thanks. it's good to have the press on your side. <laughs> now, we have a finely dressed young lady in the front row who's had her hand up very patiently for us. That's uh, Mrs. Uh, Washington. Uh, Ooh. Yes. Oh, wow. I, I figured you would recognize her. 
Ah, well, well, let's hear from your old friend. You have a question. <laughs> oh, how are we all alive? So how are you oh, missing? Oh, that question if I'm You're including oh, yourself in that, yes, though. Okay. President Lincoln has an answer. Yes. There's a very famous writer named William Shakespeare. And in one of his plays, he said, we are such stuff as dreams are made on. And our little life is rounded with a sleep. So for all we know, you are in your bed dreaming about us. Or we are in our beds dreaming about you, and nobody can really tell the difference. But you might as well just enjoy it while it lasts. This, yeah. <laughs> That's a great thought about that. We have another question up front. Yes, my friend. Oh, now this is a great question. What is your favorite room in the White House? Because I understand that it changed quite a bit between okay. each of your presidencies. I so I would love to hear this answer. The favorite room in the White House. You were the first to live there from day one, yes? Well, uh, technically speaking, I never lived in the White House oh. because we didn't call it the White House yet. <laughs> it was more of a, a peach color. Mm. And then remember we mentioned the War of 1812 earlier? Very exciting reading, children. Go, read a book on it. Uh, the, the British burned the White House, but it wasn't the White House yet. And then it was the charred house, or the charcoal-colored house. When they rebuilt it, then it became a lighter color. However, what was my favorite room in the White House? Probably the foyer next to the exit when I left after my two <laughs> terms. Having said that, I will say that I enjoyed my time alone in my office. We didn't have an Oval Office yet either. It was a different shape. I enjoyed my time alone in the office uh, because I could be quiet. I had a lot of quiet time. And I had a, a pet mockingbird who, when I had all the doors closed in my office and the windows closed, I'd let him out of his cage and he'd fly around while I was working and he'd sit on my shoulder. And sometimes I would hold him. I would hold my fingers. I would feed him. I'd hold food in my lips and feed him the food and held in my lips. I couldn't do that any, in any of the larger rooms because he could fly around. We never get him again. But my office there, which you would call the Oval Office in your day, might be my favorite because of my, my memories of my little pet bird, my mockingbird. Mm -hmm. well, well, it's really me. well, it's a, a big house, you know, uh, <laughs> biggest one I ever lived in, the finest too, an awful lot of people running around all day. Somebody once asked me, how many people work in the White House? I said, well, from my experience, about half of them. <laughs> and there were times when I'd just like to get away by myself for a while. So I, there was a little library at the time with just two chairs in it. And I'd go sit in there for a while and shut the door to get a little rest. So you could say that was my favorite room to be surrounded by books and knowledge. It was very comforting. I would agree. Of course, having a good book around is always a wonderful thing. Uh, one of course, I quite enjoyed my office as well. It was also rectangular in shape. Uh, but uh, of course, when I became the president, uh, my wife worked with designers and architects to actually expand the house so uh, that the offices would not necessarily be in the middle of the house. Uh, eventually they were moved over uh, to the side. And of course, uh, but having a good office was always lovely. And what was very beneficial to me was the portraits that I kept with me. Uh, I kept a portrait of Mr. Lincoln, as I, I wished to uh, uh, to be reminded of his efforts and uh, and his example as president. And of course, the other good fellow uh, that I had uh, in my office uh, was another fine fellow, uh, my father. And of course, I would always have my father's portrait with me in whatever office that I was in as a good reminder, because he was a, a dear man, a strong, stout-hearted man who cared for the good of the people and uh, always ensured to make sure that their lives were better. And I always had his uh, picture as an example uh, to remind me of how I might be a better president. Oh, well, thank you for all those responses. And your response about expanding the White House really reminded me because you had, uh, as the youngest man ever to become president, you had quite a few children living in that way. Oh, huh? yes, indeed. It was, it was quite rambunctious around there. Uh, of course, uh, now, uh, Ted uh, spent most of his time at Groton, and, uh, and then, of course, Kermit spent a great deal of time there as well. But the younger children, uh, Ethel and, uh, of course, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Archie and Quentin, oh, they, Archie and Quentin started a little group called the White House Gang. 
And they ran amok in the house and wherever they could, there were some sons of Supreme Court justices and, uh, and senators, and they all gathered together and formed the White House gang. And they would, uh, they would throw spit, blow spitballs at the presidential portraits. They would uh, roll snowballs off the roof and knock them down onto the White House police. <laughs> There was at one point, they were actually uh, shining mirrors, shining light into the offices at the Naval War uh, Office. And finally, I had to have one of my men go up with a semaphore uh, flags and order the people to meet the commander, which was me. But they were having such a good time, I couldn't be let mad at them for long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Wow, I have a lot of hands up now. I see a hand up all the way in that back corner there. You, my friend, you're in a multicolored jacket, yes. Loud and clear, my friend. How, How do you do get, get places? So, get oh, places? that is a great question. How did you travel as presidents uh, yes. uh, back in your days? Well, uh, in, in my you. day, we traveled a lot more slowly than in your day. <laughs> um, I think about everything moved more slowly in my day than in your day. I would travel, we would travel by carriage if we could afford one and if there were roads, but there weren't always roads. I would most often travel by horseback when I came to Philadelphia from my home in Charlottesville, Virginia in 1776, my favorite horse's name was Caractacus. When I was president of the United States, my favorite horse's name was Eagle, which is appropriate for being here in Philadelphia. <laughs> and I had, I had a lot of thoroughbred horses, I raised them. I also had horses named, one was named Polly Peachum. And none of the one of my thoroughbreds was, two of them were named Romulus and Remus. So for the most part, we got around by walking, which I think is the best form of, of exercise, or horseback. Hmm. All right. Well, I imagine things well, changed in, quite a bit for you. In my life, I have traveled by foot quite a few miles. I traveled by flat boat down the Mississippi River. I traveled by horseback uh, or a wagon pulled by an ox sometimes. I traveled by steamboat when they invented steamboats. And eventually they invented the railroad and I did a lot of traveling on the railroad. Uh, now there's a feller named Thaddeus Lowe who uh, operates a great big gas balloon uh, that he uses. They send him up and he can look over the countryside and see what the Confederate soldiers are doing. It's, it's very interesting that it's a fella named Lowe who likes to be up way high. <laughs> but I thought uh, that most people don't know about him and I thought you, you'd enjoy a good balloon story. <laughs> uh, did you travel, I'm um, just real quick, to here to us in Philadelphia by train? Because I recall you visited us here just before becoming president on President's Day or Washington's yes, birthday. Yes, I, right? I stopped in Philadelphia on General Washington's birthday and uh, made a speech at Independence Hall and raised a flag in honor of the president, uh, that is uh, uh, ex-president Washington. And it was quite an honor for me to speak in that room where they had written the declaration and signed the constitution, a great, uh, a humbling experience. And I, I was glad I was there. And President Roosevelt. I will say that uh, I have uh, shared the same means of travel as both these gentlemen here, uh, uh, by foot, by, uh, by horse, by, by train. Uh, of course, uh, I was the first president of the United States to travel in an automobile as well, uh, which uh, was fine enough, although a bit jostling. Uh, and I was also actually the first president to ever ride in an aeroplane, uh, one of the uh, the Wright brothers contraption uh, that they would uh, allow us to uh, glide up into the air for a very short period of time. And uh, <laughs> of course, the poor, the poor pilot was so concerned because I was so happy to be up in the air. I was waving at all the crowds and he was afraid I was throwing off the balance of the plane. But I will say that uh, the best means of transportation to me uh, has always been uh, walking and horseback, very much like you, Mr. Jefferson, uh, because it gives very good uh, exercise and it certainly does the heart good and uh, fills my lungs with good fresh air. So I was always very happy to uh, travel by horse. Actually, my, my, my one of my favorite horses was Little Texas that uh, I'd rode in in Cuba. And then, of course, uh, Blystein was a, another fellow horse that was named for one of our senators but uh, <laughs> we had a very good time with many horses yes all right i see a few question hands up i have a friend ooh, friend in the red jacket in the back there yes sir oh oh yes sir
Hmm. Oh, uh, are we asking our opinion for support for the revolution for support for hmm. Hmm. so let me see if i understand the question i think he friend. wants to know if we were right to be revolting ah. <laughs> there was a debate about whether the united states or great britain were more guilty of doing bad things hmm. and well I think that ju judging Great Britain in the long term, I didn't get along with a lot of uh, a lot of Great Britain in many ways. The king, when I first met the king of Great Britain, he was rude to me. Can't imagine why. <laughs> but I think judging whether or not one country has done more bad things and made more mistakes than another country, to me, might be a distraction from the most important thing to focus on for me. Because my focus, instead of on who's done more bad things, is how can we figure out how to improve, to do better than we've done in the past? What the American Revolution, in my mind, was meant to do was not to say, look at us, we're better than everybody else. Instead, the American Revolution was meant to say, we are going to set a new set of goals that are higher goals than people have tried to achieve before, and then we're going to work on trying to do better to get closer to those goals. Uh, the Declaration of Independence said what that goal was. It said all men are created equal. So the idea is that one day all men, meaning all people, so ladies, you too, would be treated as they are created, as equals. Well, that's the goal that we set right at the very beginning of the United States of America in the Declaration of Independence. So I don't mean to avoid your question, but I think if we focus on what we can do right, we don't spend as much time wasting our time arguing about who's done more wrong. Thank you for those questions, folks. I want to remind you that our presidents will be uh, with us for a bit longer here at the Constitution Center today and would love to, I'm sure, uh, hear from you folks and uh, answer a few more of your questions about their experiences or their thoughts. Or, um, But now I think what I would like to get your thoughts on uh, is a few of these costumes that we have assembled here today ah, yes uh, and so we're going to be having our friend jeff uh from td bank joining us on stage and we have ooh, and in our the meanwhile if you have a question that you wanted to ask hold on to it tightly and when we're done with things here we'll be happy to speak with you further would you like to do the honors oh of course all right folks are we ready we've got a few entries here come on jeff you can join us up front first Seeing where our friend James Sommer, we have a ooh, a very young Gerald Ford joining us here today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, I do believe that's the first that's I think I've true. seen. That's very I don't know if we're looking at a Michigan football uniform or what. <laughs> All right. Our next participant. Oh, we've got a couple of first ladies here today. Now, somebody was asking where they were on stage with you gentlemen, but here they come. Uh, we'll need... Uh, Chloe O'Donnell to be our Martha Washington. Ah, there she is. That was James and George. All right, there we go, Chloe. That's a fine Martha Washington costume. I'm going to step alongside here. Come on in front of the presidents. Oh, Joe Roy, you can stand in front of us? Oh, yeah. yes, of course. We've served President that. Lincoln is a tall fellow. You can stand in front of him. And I'm looking for Ariel as our Jackie Kennedy. Wow, look at that. Very still. Very Jacqueline camera. Kennedy. <laughs> Ariel Ferry, is that right? Oh, all right. Wonder. <laughs> all right. Mr. Ford's on the moon. Looks like we have some great nominees here today. So at this point, oh, we have another costume. Oh. Yeah. Would we? Oh, we're, oh, we're, we're, oh, the audience is already trying to tell our presidents and Jeff who <laughs> to we, vote we for. Oh, 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 we do believe, I think, in a private ballot. Do we not, gentlemen? A oh. secret to be able to be to just to consider our votes um, yeah now these three uh, and our uh, esteemed guest uh, Jeff will be just deciding who will be our winner of our costume contest this year did you folk fellas need a a moment to uh, discuss with one another moment yes of course so I suppose I should ask our friends here as we as we do so hmm. How, how, you know, what inspired you to dress as Gerald Ford today? <laughs> what about you, ladies? What do you? He's gone to a lot of places and 
As Charles will tell you, he always hugs Gerald Ford statues for some reason. <laughs> so we're not sure, but he thinks it's must resemble some oh, wow. of the affinity to Gerald Ford. And Martha Washington, was there something that inspired you specifically for Martha Washington? I like the look of it. Okay, well, it's a great costume. And, and you know, it's a really compelling historical figure. Are you a big fan of Jacqueline Kennedy? That's true. Well, you know what? So are you. <laughs> All right. Well, gentlemen, have we... Uh, Reach a conclusion. Jeff, would you like to uh, announce the winner for us? I'll step over here. First of all, what a ridiculously difficult decision this is. <laughs> How about a big round of applause for all of our contestants? <laughs> After some very challenging deliberations, the presidents and I are pleased to announce that the winner of this year's National Constitution Center President's Day Costume Contest is Ariel Farry, Jackie Kennedy. <laughs> well done. Thank you. For, thank you folks so much. We really want to thank you all for joining us. We want to thank TD Bank for being the wonderful sponsor, bringing all our great programming and our free admission here today on President's Day. I want to thank Presidents Jefferson, Roosevelt, and Lincoln. It's always an honor to join you, gentlemen. Can't wait till I'm president. Right. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Let's get a photo. Let's get a photo. We would we would love to get a photo with you. Like this, you are the runner up. Would, would you like to get a photo on stage with the presidents? Yeah. Let's go on. Come on. Let's go for it.